So we've got a lot to get through in the next hour or so. And to unpack all of this and more, I'd now like to invite our panellists to the stage. Uh, we're very lucky to have with us today European Commissioner for the Security Union, Julian King. If you'd like to come on stage, Mr King. Tumas Hendrik Ilves, former President of Estonia and member of the Transatlantic Commission on Election Integrity. Pavel Telichka, Vice President of the European Parliament and ALDE MEP. And Liga writer Rojentale, Director of EU Governmental Affairs for Cybersecurity Policy at Microsoft. Thank you very much. Wonderful. So let's get straight into it with quite a general uh, opening to the discussion. I'd like to turn to you first, Commissioner. Um, what exactly do we mean when we say election interference? And why would certain actors seek to influence the outcome of an election? Uh, well, election interference can take all sorts of different forms. We've seen all sorts of different examples. Uh, to give you just some of the obvious ones, uh, there are... Uh, cyber attacks, uh, hacks and leaks, getting hold of information, circulating it, sometimes mixed up with false information. Uh, there are uh, disinformation uh, campaigns, uh, which is one of the things which I'm sure we'll talk about a little bit more. Uh, and then there is um, the slightly more insidious, more difficult to define, doing stuff that somehow raises some questions around the integrity of the process. Even if you don't actually... Um, get hold of information, uh, but you somehow leave some doubt in the voters, the citizens' minds about the integrity of the process. Those are the sort of things that we're trying to guard against. And what's the aim here? I mean, why are the actors essentially looking to influence the outcome of an election? What's their goal? Uh, well, I think it depends on the election. Uh, but uh, I'm focused, uh, as others on this panel are, uh, in doing what we can to mitigate the risks around the European Parliament. Uh, elections, uh, and I can imagine that someone might want to uh, seat cast uh, a cloud of suspicion over those elections because that would have an impact on the credibility of, of the Parliament, an absolutely essential institution for the next five years. Okay, interesting, thank you. Uh, Mr. Ilves, I'd like to move on to you now. Uh, being a member of the Transatlantic Commission on Election Integrity, what principles and concrete measures do you think international cooperation on countering election interference rely on? Right, well, uh, I think I, I would sort of start off by actually um, elaborating on what Julian said. I mean, we have to think of uh, interference in elections not specifically looking at the methodology used. Uh, I mean, in the Macedonian election, you had also bribes, uh, you had GRU agents in Greece, I mean, you had all kinds of things, ranging from cyber attacks through this completely sort of uh, analog system uh, manipulation attempts. So we have to think about, I mean, we have, we have penetration, intrusion, hacking, we have doxing, which was crucial both in the Macron election, uh, the campaign, or presidential election in France and in the US election, doxing twice, uh, first the DNC server, later on the campaign manager server's information. Uh, we go on from there to bots that will repeat uh, over and over again certain things. We have simply the distribution of fake news. We have manipulation of creating groups. Uh, I mean, there was a famous case, uh, the face one Facebook group, anti-Islamic, the other one for Islam, organizing a from Petersburg by the IRA, the Internet Research Agency, a potential clash on the sa at the same time on the same street corner. Fortunately, that didn't happen. So there's a wide range of things. And therefore, we, it's not strictly a cyber issue. It is, it is a disinformation problem. And it can even go so far as uh, in Montenegro, an attempted coup. Why do they do this? Well, I would say, first, first and foremost, I mean, this is what you asked Julian, but Look, it's a lot cheaper if you can change a government through manipulating the election than invading it, right? I mean, that's what it really comes down to. If, if you, can get, uh, you can get Marine Le Pen to take France out of NATO, you've really accomplished a great deal. So, and it's a lot more cheaply than invading. I mean, you just want to, if 
you do that, NATO falls apart, you've lost an enemy, and it actually doesn't take much money. Uh, so uh, the kinds of things that we need to do uh, really range across all of those different possibilities. Now, I'm just, I'm, uh, one way of dealing with this, uh, you mentioned the APT28 uh, discovery this morning by Microsoft, but one of the things that I was going to ask in the last panel, the earlier panel, but do we have to go beyond these level, this level of generalities of best practices and all of this stuff? We need, when you have APT28, APT29, and the Internet Research Agency, active in every single country in Western or in Europe of the EU and NATO, which, I mean, that's what I do is I study where they are. They're, they've done something one way or another, whether it be elections or politics in every country in Europe, plus the US and Canada, and maybe elsewhere. Now, this is the absurd situation that we're in. We have APT28, we have APT29, and we have the IRA. We are responses to this up till now have always been strictly national. We do not talk about who, what, is the, what is the profile of APT28 so that an election commission in Slovenia would be able to recognize the, an attack the, uh, the way an election commission in Belgium. I mean, so when we talk about best practices, blah, 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 we're actually, what we're doing, we have an organization too, actually, you and we have NATO, and we do not actually do any effective work to, to ensure that our institutions involved in elections are actually getting the kind of information that they need. Um, now, one thing that, um, I mean, one thing that's less important, I guess, in, in Europe than the United States, but actually there are some huge vulnerabilities in this kind of, I thought, always thought ridiculous move to go over to electronic voting machines, which of which some of them are completely hackable. Um, I don't know why they did this, and now, and then when you see because of the system in the United States, you even have state governments not wanting to admit that they were bad, companies not wanting to admit they're bad. Um, there's a, been a lack of responsibility, taking of responsibility for the security of elections. Um, now the Trans Commission, Trans Atlantic Commission on Electoral Integrity actually tries to look at all of these things, from the strictly technical to the more broadly political. Just, to, just to cut across that, Mr. Oliver, sorry, but on the subject of electric voting, electronic voting systems themselves, I mean, what possibly can the EU do to protect itself in this regard? Because elections, even at an EU level, are <coughs> national competency. So, I mean, what sort this of... This is the problem. You, we, in the digital era, you have to start thinking differently. You want to talk... I mean, if you want to restrict yourself to national competency, then, w then and you're being attacked by three groups that are identifiable, then then screw it. I mean, you're not going to have democracy. Mm. I mean, this U.S. has the same problem. You have the state of Georgia and the state of South Carolina saying, we are not going to let the Federal Election Commission come in here because we have sovereignty in this question. Fine, but then don't, you don't, mm. you just, then you basically give up. Now, what the responses, as I started saying, are m manifold. Uh, there's the technical and then there's the political. Uh, what we just came out with this weekend was to say that, look, we want every candidate to pledge that he or she and every party will not use these different which, uh, methods which we enumerated there, ranging again from using docs material to uh, disseminating fake news. I mean, there's a range of things, and if uh, you need to have actually candidates and parties signing up to this, not simply waiting for someone else to do something. Okay, great. I'd just like to move on to Ms. Rosenthal quickly, Mr. Ulvers, if you don't mind. Um, would you be able to disclose any further information about these hacks that have been announced today uh, as being detected by Microsoft hitting the German Marshall Fund, amongst others? I mean, you haven't disclosed a source. How much can you tell us? Well, first of all, I want to step back before I address this question because I have a few comments relating to what's been said and, uh, and our general approach to election security. I think it's uh, essential to note that on the stage is uh, on a state stream, we have governments, we have academia, and we have uh, industry as well. 
So this is a, important to point out that we all have our role to play, and Microsoft as an industry representative uh, looks at our role and what we can do here, and to identify that we look where there are threats and what we can do to identify information when it's necessary and pass that information on to the general public, to governments, uh, to civil society, to see how that can be processed and how that can be taken forward um, in, in, in various ways that, uh, that it's necessary. When you look at uh, election technology as a whole, I think there have been lots of growing pains and to find the solutions that are necessary has not been easy. The governments have spent uh, millions trying to address what is the safest online voting uh, applications and, and possibilities. And I can't say that there has been one solution that has emerged as the best solution. Perhaps uh, President Dilvis could say how Estonia is doing on that, but I'd say that they're the most forward in, in Europe and looking at this issue and, and developing an ecosystem to address more than one issue, not just a voting machine, but uh, having a society that accepts these kind of practices and looks at a wider range of awareness and information about being safe online. Um, as I said, we all have a role to play and contributing to more cyberspace, and we look at what we can do. And looking at the European elections, we also look at how we can take the information that we have and looking at threats um, across globally, how we can provide tools that assist democratic processes. Okay. 2016. Just to cut yeah. across quickly, do, do you think generally the tech sector is mature enough to realise its social responsibility in the context of elections? Because, I mean, these, uh, if we look at businesses like Facebook and Twitter, they were never created, you know, with social responsibilities in mind. You know, this is a radical mm -hmm. change in the mentality of these, these tech giants. Is there this sense of a social responsibility there? I think there's a sense of social responsibility, but when you address maturity, what is mature enough? I think that we always have the opportunity to grow in this field, and I think that we address these issues try by trying to be a responsible actor in the space to the extent that we have in the sphere that we can do. We look at the services we provide, and we look at democratic processes and see what we can do to assist. And that is why today we've also announced that we will have a service called Account Guard, which helps to protect email, which helps to protect candidates uh, in, in um, election processes, and, um, and we want to address uh, the cyber th threats on democracies in this way. We will roll this out in 12 additional countries. We are already uh, up offering this service in the UK and Ireland, but the, we will also include uh, 12 others uh, t today and forward, and we will look at other ways to assist elections across Europe in the future as well. Um, I can give more information on that as if you'd like, but I'll stop here. Okay, let's move on to Mr. Talichka now. Um, election interference, is this an issue that concerns the people on the street across Europe? Is this something that really, really bugs, you know, the milkman from Manchester, the general public across the continent? Well, good afternoon. I must admit I have not spoken recently with the, with the milkman in Manchester, <laughs> so I, I'm not sure I know his uh, point of view, but uh, uh, obviously we have a uh, uh, rather diverging uh, situation uh, in member states. So you can just have a look at uh, the European elections of 2014 and uh, clearly the turnout already shows the difference. So if you have a member state where the turnout was uh, 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 below 19%, then you have a partial answer to your question. But that's not necessarily the issue. In fact, that is also a part of the concern because as, as uh, uh, all the panelists have spoken, uh, and, I, and I think that uh, especially uh, the gentleman spoke of the European elections, uh, with a low turnout, and you do pose the question to Julian King, you know, wh wh what is the threat? Well, in reality, with a low turnout, it doesn't take that much to influence the elections. Because if you have a turnout and you have a system of uh, preferences, well, if you really target well, you can cut basically a certain uh, individual into the European Parliament. Yeah? It's as easy as that uh, with the consequences that it has. But if I may just say uh, one or two additional comments, uh, uh, let's say beyond the European elections, what has not necessarily been uh, said, and uh, I was provoked to say that uh, in the context of the social responsibility of the companies, well, where is the responsibility, the political responsibility? You know, and we have differences between member states. You, you would have member states which are serious, relatively mature, just to hijack the word for, for a second. Uh, uh, well, you know, you've got electronic voting, you've got uh, good uh, certification schemes, so you will never be sufficiently secure, but there is certain resilience. But you have member states where you've got rather key political figures, a part of the system of those on the other side of the barrier, so to say. 
So what I'm still looking for is a change of a mindset. Whenever there is uh, Cambridge Analytica, whatever, we are on alert. But then it, uh, it, it goes down. Uh, and while we keep and maintain certain leadership, we work on the Cybersecurity Act mm -hmm. and so on, uh, you, ca you definitely do see, at least in some quarters, that uh, the attention is, is decreasing. Uh, and if you combine it then, uh, uh, as I say, with those that in fact are on the other side of the barrier, then uh, you'd not necessarily get the result you would like to have. And I have a concrete experience uh, because uh, together with Vice President Ansip, uh, uh, who was responsible in the commission, uh, and uh, my uh, fellow uh, uh, co-rapporteurs, we dealt with the Cybersecurity Act. And we all speak at this event, similar events, in a very strong language. We all are united. We want to tackle it. But then you come to the, uh, the, the point where you need to agree in a trialogue on a certain text, and you see how, how differently we perceive some of the threats, the concerns, and you definitely see member states which are not keen, what uh, President Ilves has said, that you, you need to have a general approach, you need to have a European approach, and not just even European. If you don't have it, you're fragmented, you're more vulnerable, and quite often you don't have it. So I'm not a maniac to, I mean, delegate powers at any price uh, to the European level, but clearly, you know, we are as strong or as weak as the weakest part of the chain in the European Union is strong or weak. And I think that this also means that we need to change the mindset in a consistent way. And then we can approach with that mindset all the instruments, uh, whether those are political, regulatory, technological, whatever, and you can really be much more resilient. Okay. Mr. Can King. Can I just react to uh, uh, something that uh, my neighbor Thomas Ilva has said? Uh, of course, there are some challenges for the EU in reacting uh, to these uh, different threats and risks. But it's not true uh, that there's nothing we can do at the moment, and it's not true that we are uh, not acting. So uh, in, particular in, in particular, in the perspective of the European uh, elections, which aren't that far away, uh, we have to do things that we can realistically get on with now. Uh, so we are working uh, with uh, the European Parliament, uh, with the parties and with candidates. Uh, we've had a series of meetings with them. Indeed, we had meetings yesterday. We've got meetings tomorrow because there are things that the candidates can do, starting with taking your pledge and acting on it. I, I so that, so that's, <laughs> that's good. Uh, we, we are working with the member states. So we've brought together the member states in new networks that didn't exist before so that they can exchange experience, learn from each other, and take steps on cybersecurity, tackling disinformation, and something else we haven't mentioned so far, uh, protecting uh, personal data in, a, in this context to avoid the abuse of personal data in an electoral context. Also, that they can uh, have a rapid alert mechanism because these campaigns of disinformation in particular often happen in more than one country, in more than one media. So knowing about them and being able to spread information quickly about them is one part of dealing with them. So those networks amongst member states which didn't exist we are now promoting and building. Uh, we should have done it sooner. I agree, but we're doing it now. And we are engaging with uh, the private sector. Uh, and in this context, that essentially means the big social media platforms, because they are the vector for a lot of uh, some of the difficulties, that, especially uh, around disinformation. So uh, we have got cooperation uh, with the big social media platforms on the basis of a, of a, of a code of good conduct which is an international first, where we've agreed with them the areas that we want to focus on, particularly trying to increase the transparency in political debate. So that means tackling issues around political ads, sponsored content, the activity, as you said, of bots and fake accounts. Why are we tolerating so much activity from bots and fake accounts in the political space? The need to do uh, adequate, quick corrections, the need to give access to alternative points of view, and all of that subject to greater independent scrutiny. And if we can make progress on some of those things, they're challenging, but if we can make progress on some of those things, it will make a difference. So I agree that um, uh, you could imagine another world in which the EU had powers to intervene more directly in uh, elections in this part of Europe or, 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 else, or elsewhere. Uh, that world doesn't exist. Some people would argue that it's... It's got disadvantages as well as advantages, but within the current structures, we are making progress to try and reduce the risks uh, around uh, the European parliamentary elections. 
Thank you. Mr Ilves, how do you um, review what the Commissioner has done thus far? Is it simply a case of too little, too late? I think the Commission has actually been uh, very forward-looking. Lo uh, a couple of points. I mean, I think that, um, first of all, we have to, if we look at the social media companies, then in fact uh, they've lost a huge amount of trust by denying things, saying it, saying it was crazy, Zuckerberg says it's crazy that uh, to say the Russians intervened. And, and then it turns out much later than in fact they knew. So, and this has repeatedly happened, always followed by, we're very sorry. Uh, so I think that there's a huge amount of uh, distrust. I think more basically, and this is what comes to the, also the issue of national competence and so far, is that I would say that since 2007 or so, we live in a different era as important as the trend, as the difference between before movable type and print and after. Social media came about in the first part of this, the first couple of years of this millennium, and then the combination of that and the ubiquity of mobile devices that allow up to two billion people to be on Facebook means that we are in a completely different media environment uh, and if you look at people spend more time on their mobile phones than on social media, then they wa do watching television. And we're still thinking in the old national categories. The legislation that will be needed to deal with this, you could keep at a national level, but ultimately um, I think we will have to revise our thinking on how it is that the European Union treats elections and also in general this, these kinds of attacks that we see, and this is why I s started out saying that they, if they have a limited number of actors attacking virtually every country, and not only countries, but think tanks, parliaments, ministries, even the World Anti-Doping Agency, that this requires a huge amount of, of collaboration, cooperation, and exchange of data. And the fora for that are fairly limited. It's either going to be NATO or it's going to be the EU, and if it doesn't happen, then we're all going to be individually fighting against a serious uh, opponent. Okay, and conversation around election interference is quite often dominated with accusations against Russia, North Korea, Iran, but shouldn't we also be considering those who propagate uh, fake news and disinformation and things like that within the EU, within the bloc. And I'm referring here to um, the Commission's comments yesterday that Hungary, Hungary's uh, immigration campaign could be described as something of a fake news campaign. And also Italy's, uh, the state broadcaster of Rai, a gentleman called Mr. Marcello Foa. In the past, he has battled accusations of uh, propagating fake news and disinformation. Do we have a blind spot in only looking at players like Russia and Iran and North Korea and countries like that? Um, well, there's also a third category, which are the, uh, the sort of wi uh, unwitting accomplices, the ones that the 10,000 people who in the United States uh, became followers of a, of a Russian IRA-created uh, site called 10GOP. So there are actually three groups. Uh, well, I mean, I would say within the European Union, ultimately, if it's domestic and domestically oriented, there's not much you can say. I mean, this, uh, this campaign currently against Juncker and Soros, putting them together and spreading lies, that's in Hungarian toward Hungarians. Uh, I think there our arms won't reach. On the other hand, if APT28 is working in every single country, doc, uh, hacking and doxing, then we can do something. I'm afraid it's very difficult to go after, to get individual nation states to do that, uh, other than sort of expressing your uh, dismay at these kinds of campaigns. Okay. Uh, Ms. Rosenthal, um, going back to the subject of disinformation, um, what's your view thus far on the collaboration with the Commission with regards to the Code of Conduct? Because I know that LinkedIn is a signatory, obviously owned by Microsoft. Um, do you think this is an effective way to guard citizens against the threat of disinformation in the context of the elections? I think that it's an excellent start to address disinformation and 
uh, to work with uh, the social media platforms to address how there could be measures taken that can address these problems. Uh, at Microsoft, we also look at this, uh, the code of conduct and we look at how we can assist in disinformation. And that's, we uh, work actively with academics to fuel studies on, on how this can be improved in this area. We also look towards partners such as NewsGuard, which is an organization that works on uh, journalistic integrity for online sources, so that if you are browsing the press, there is some sort of indication of if, is this a trusted source, not necessarily anything that goes towards censorship or towards the content, but who is writing uh, what you are reading? Is it uh, a journalist for who, who, who is uh, saying they're from this website, or is it from, uh, from some source that is just uh, pretending to be something else? So we try to find other ways around um, addressing the problem of spreading disinformation rather than... Um, no, to work and work with the Commission on the, on the projects that they have. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Talichka, what is it that makes disinformation campaigns so effective? Why is this a tool that uh, malicious actors turn to again and again in order to influence the outcomes of elections? Well, uh, I will have to be a, a bit political to start with uh, because I really believe that, uh, and whether I'm on or not, maybe I'm not really switched off, but do you hear me? Yeah? Mm -hmm. I'm still on, okay. Well, uh, let's uh, let's start by the very fact that uh, you know uh, the the society is highly polarized. Uh, regardless what uh, we may think as individuals, I mean globalization has brought uh, enormous opportunities uh, uh, and and benefits, and many that are prepared to really profit from it. But at the same time, what we see is that there is a part uh, of the society that. Uh, in an unfortunate way, sometimes are considered to be the losers of, of globali globalization. And if I would take, for example, my country, which uh, of course uh, uh, regained its uh, full sovereignty and, uh, and, uh, and uh, turned uh, back towards democracy only in uh, November 89, well, part of those uh, that were in power, uh, let's say parts of those society, they also feel that they are part, yeah, that they are the losers. And whatever comes next, whatever came next, you know, it was not for, for their benefit. So by definition, you already have a part of the society which is vulnerable. And uh, those that uh, will work with the fake news, uh, those that uh, want to influence certain development, that want to create a certain mood, certain climate, environment in the society, or that would be then beneficial for, let's say, some other instruments, they already have a target group. And let's face it, we politicians, uh, I'm not a career politician, but okay, now I am. Uh, you know, what we have sort of forgotten, the political elite have forgotten that we've got that group. And that, of course, is, or let's say, part of society is vulnerable. It's vulnerable to nationalism, populism, but it's also vulnerable to fake news. Because they are often, uh, what they get is what they want to hear. They often get it in a very simple, understandable way. And let's also face it that those that are spreading uh, fake news, they are good in communication. Yeah, it's, it's, they are quite often professional. Uh, and that's, that's uh, I would say, the enemy, the adversary, but that's what we are coping with. So I would say that that's a part of the answer to your question, why are they that uh, successful? So you've got a vulnerable part of the society, you've got different target groups, uh, we are living in a world of, uh, of high tech, uh, the speed is, is incredible. Not any longer we can, uh, we can rely on the fact that uh, some of the uh, socially weaker or let's say more senior groups of uh, the population that they don't work everyone nearly, you know, is to be able to work uh, with emails, uh, with computers. I'm, I'm quite often uh, witnessing that those that uh, I'm getting, uh, let's say, the nastiest uh, form of emails are from people that uh, you know, have, uh, have this background. So. And, and it's extremely difficult, especially if you basically abandon them, you leave aside work, and, and that already creates certain percentage of the society. I would say, if I would take the Czech Republic, some, something like 30%, with which even those that are not on the fake news side, but let's say the populist nationalists, they can work with. Uh, and I mean, there are many more reasons, but uh, that I, I would just want to introduce also this sort of uh, political or even uh, 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 sociology, uh, let's say, point of view, which uh, because that's a part of the whole, uh, let's say, mosaic. Thank you. Mr. Rilevez, would you like to respond? Well, I think there are also some very fundamental human uh, things at work which, uh, which assist in fa the spread of fake news, that people are more willing to uh, 
retweet or share something which is outrageous than something that is banal. I mean, if you say, or put it differently, there, there's this old thing that it, if a dog bites m a man, it's not news. If a, if a, uh, if a man bites a dog, it, that's news. The thing is that people <laughs> will retweet or share that even if the man did not buy, uh, bite the dog. And we see this over and over, that, the, uh, that fake news, ridiculous news, is shared far, far more than, than, the, than sort of the believable regular news. And you, s you saw this in the US presidential election. I mean, you would have dry articles about Hillary Clinton's policy positions, and then you'd have these ridiculous statements by Donald Trump, uh, which were outrageous, and those would get be spread, whereas who wants to bother reading, you know, sharing news on a, on a position paper? I mean, that's, mm. that's one of, that's just human nature. So you're saying this is something essential to the human condition, to desire for something scandalous, regardless of the fact of whether it's true or not. Yes. Yeah, speak for yourself. Well, yes, yeah, absolutely, journalists and speaking you, here. You also enjoy it much more reading what you want to read. Yeah? I mean, th this is also a part of, uh, of uh, let's say, a character of a, of a human being, and again, especially with uh, a certain uh, parts of the society. So you really read what you want to read. And uh, that makes you happy. You, you seek it. That uh, satisfies you. That sort of uh, creates emotions. Uh, that turns you on. That, uh, that uh, uh, makes you uh, a vector of your own because you're then spreading the information to, let's say, like-minded. Yes, and bearing that in mind, you know, with so much attraction surrounding this scandalous, albeit fake news, do you think the Commission was right to introduce the Code of Practice against disinformation as a self-regulatory mechanism? Well, again, you have to start somewhere. So uh, we wanted to get action. Uh, again, I'm sorry to keep coming back to it, but we had a time scale. Uh, we wanted to get action in advance of the European parliamentary elections. Uh, and to get that action realistically started, uh, we engaged on this uh, voluntary basis. Uh, but we've said from the outset, we've been entirely transparent about this, uh, that if when we come to review things uh, after a year, uh, in, uh, the, uh, in the early autumn, uh, we haven't seen the kind of progress that we're, uh, we're all agreeing we need, then we do not rule out looking at other ways of doing this. Uh, and we've shown in some of the steps we've taken uh, elsewhere, for example, in targeting uh, illegal content online, that uh, sometimes you have to go beyond voluntary cooperation. Sometimes you have to go into the regulatory space. Now, if we do go down that route uh, in terms of disinformation, I think, personally, it will be very important that we are clear, and again, hopefully we'll be able to show on the basis of evidence, things we've done, uh, that we're not targeting uh, particular pieces of content to determine whether they are true or false or good or bad, because that is censorship, and it's not gonna work. Uh, but what we're talking about is rules at the moment, codes of practice, but eventually <coughs> rules, uh, about transparency, about greater clarity around the provenance of material that you are seeing as a citizen and as a voter. And I think that that is legitimate. Uh, I hope we're able to make rapid progress on the basis that we're, that we're working on at the moment. But if necessary, I could imagine that you would find ways of enforcing greater transparency. Yes. Also asking at a, yes. on a national level, let's say the DG Nets law, so that which is Germany has taken up, but other countries m have not yet. But though France apparently will or is in the process of doing something similar. Great, Ms. Rosenthal. I wanted to mention on the code of uh, of, of um, on disinformation as well. When when you invite the private sector into the discussions and invite them to have a voluntary code that stimulates the discussion of what w our services actually are and how they are influenced by disinformation and what pathways could be taken to spread dis disinformation in the various services we provide. <coughs> and it also creates the forum on discussions with other par similar partners so that we can find solutions that may have been thought of by the commission, but we could also find solutions that are not uh, created by the commission. So by having that n initial uh, voluntary mechanism, it stimulates the discussion to perhaps find better, uh, better solutions. Mr. Selichka. Well, I, I would tend to agree. I would say that uh, what we need, I've already mentioned that we, you need to uh, change the mindset, but you need to change the culture. You need to create a certain uh, level of awareness, but also the question of uh, 
though in relation to the business sector, uh, to the private sector, we spoke of social responsibility. So you need to also create a feeling of responsibility. Uh, and I think that uh, if you g come uh, out with hard, uh, let's say, regulation or with a regulatory environment, it, it can backfire. It's like a boomerang. I mean, uh, if you don't have uh, yet the environment ready, I mean, it's gonna uh, it's gonna backslash. So I don't think that uh, that would be the right approach. And I think that uh, even though with some of the uh, large platforms, uh, this in the initial stages has failed, I still believe that the self-regulation plays uh, a role definitely as uh, Jung King says in, in the first place. In fact, I think that we need to also understand how uh, those that we are in a sort of a struggle, how they think, how they work. You know, uh, one, one thing that I also would like to add, in fact, uh, they are in some respect attractive uh, for their target groups. So let's also be attractive. Yeah, and, and, and I must say that uh, clear in mind that uh, just came across information, it's completely from a different basket, but I found it really interesting uh, talking about uh, electoral system in the member states uh, or in, uh, elsewhere around the world uh, at the beginning. If you go to Switzerland, uh, then I understand that in Switzerland uh, there are days where the hackers uh, you know, are invited to hack uh, uh, without any consequences uh, uh, the, uh, the basically the, the, the technology, the system uh, online and so on. So that's the way to do it. I mean, uh, uh, and I think that uh, you're going to get you're going to get the results. You're again uh, more resilient, but at the same time, you're somewhat changing culture. You know, g you're giving in a certain opportunity. So I think that it's it's a, a mix that we will need that maybe we ha would have never thought of uh, uh, years back. But I, I think that that's the way to proceed. So I agree with the commissioner. I think that uh, the first uh, step is the right step. Then uh, let's evaluate. Let's not rush because you know what uh, it won't bring results overnight. We are tackling something that is of a rather systemic nature. So I would even say that maybe after the first evaluation, maybe a second one still needed. But if not, then I agree with you, and, uh, and I think that the, the majority in the parliament would agree, okay, we will have to find the right regulatory environment. We just would have to see what is for the European level, what is for the national level, which al also is sensitive and again can backfire if you mm. don't do it the right way. But surely we are moving towards uh, <coughs> a regulatory environment, Mr. King. I mean, after your first uh, compliance reports of the code were received uh, in January. You described the reports as, I believe, patchy and opaque. Uh, what exactly do you want or do you expect the platforms to provide you with in these compliance reports with the Code of Practice of Disinformation? And if it continues as it has been, regulation is surely then an inevitability. Well, I don't know about inevitability. Uh, that's not the spirit in which we entered into this. The spirit in which we entered into this was one of cooperation. Uh, again, the objectives that we defined, we defined together with the social media platforms. The performance measurements we defined together uh, with the social media platforms. So uh, at its most basic level, what we're looking for now is for those platforms to do what they agreed with us they were going to do against these objectives. Uh, so that does mean uh, greater transparency around uh, political ads, uh, action on uh, bots and fake accounts, action on corrections, and an openness to independent scrutiny. And frankly, uh, we're getting different feedback from, from different partners. Uh, we're going to report on it every month between now and the elections. Now that is obviously designed to encourage a little bit of healthy competition, uh, and to get to speed up progress and to learn, because we're learning as we're going along. Uh, some of the measures work better than other measures, so we can learn from each other. Uh, and I hope that will deliver uh, real progress in time to have an effect before the elections. The very fact of talking about it, the very fact of doing this publicity around it has some benefits. Uh, but if in the autumn we discover that there are some <coughs> real sticking points for example, around interaction with independent experts and scrutiny, then, then I think we have to look again at, at what needs to be done in those circumstances to make sure that we're getting the results we want. Thank you, Mr. Ulvis. I just want to say, I mean, we don't need to go where I'm going to go, but I'll just say that I think too much of the time we have focused strictly on social media companies and actually have not thought about the broader issue of elections and how they're done. One example, I mean, what you see every time there's uh, a hint of some kind of hacking 
is that you see my Twitter feed fills up with, go back to paper, go back to paper. Well, actually, that's, yeah, maybe you can go back to paper, but people forget that in this era, the only step that is non-digital in the electoral process is putting in that paper. And everything from making up the voter list to the counting, and then if you have, a, say, uh, multiple mandate el uh, election districts where you have to do all kinds of calculations on proportionality, all that is done digitally. And the, where you can interfere is along that entire process, not simply the paper thing. And there's this tendency to say, oh, let's not have this because we have to vote on paper. That does not, so that solves a little bit, perhaps. On the other hand, it doesn't. More broadly, and this where my thinking in the last uh, year or so has been doing, the basically researching this, these issues, is that perhaps in the digital era, we have to relook at the broader issue of what kind of elections. And I'm becoming more and more convinced that, for example, first past the post elections, which is in, which you have in all the Anglo-Saxon countries, but which is where you have some of the greatest polarization, as opposed to multiple mandate elections that lead to more of a con uh, sort of tend, to tend toward the center rather than a two-party binary decision, as you see in the UK right now and in the United States, or we s or and also referenda have to be far better thought out. Because when you have a situation where you have two more or less equally balanced sides, uh, either with parties or with a referendum question, that those are really ripe for manipulation. And you can put, and then of course when you go one step beyond with the sort of, with the 18th century electoral college system of the United States with huge disproportionalities, which was created for reasons that do not apply at all, since you have cars and planes, which was mainly had to do with will candidates go to smaller states, that maybe the electoral college system, which gave, which was, we know now, due to the work of uh, Katie Holmes Jameson, was specific, were the sm these small states with disproportionate influence were specifically targeted far more than other states where there were that was not the case. So I think we have to ultimately, we'll get to looking at where are we in the digital era with how we think of democracy. And maybe m we might have to say, well, maybe first past the post systems are not so good. Maybe referenda have to be done a little bit differently because they have such uh, dire consequences with very small differences in votes or rather in between one view or another. I mean, I think the UK at this point is a perfect example of where you had almost the same kinds of votes, but going one way or the other way leads to dramatically different outcomes and is thus ripe for manipulation. And I would bring in the uh, Netherlands referendum on something as ridiculous, at least, like as the as ratifying or supporting, allowing uh, the association agreement of Ukraine to go through with the European Union, where an association agreement is not <coughs> membership, and there's never been a referendum on membership, but an association agreement, which is just a free trade agreement plus teacher and student exchange, but the Russians focused on this, and it was, and the association agreement was defeated. This was, I mean, people forget, but this was before, this was in 2015. So we have to think about the vulnerability of certain kinds of electoral systems as opposed to others, but w I won't go in there more today. Mm. And on top of that, I mean, in terms of the fractured resilience of certain EU member states across the continent, do you think there's some member states that are more vulnerable to election interference than others? Uh, which are they and which are the more stronger? <laughs> well, I think there is one point that I will make before um, uh, giving others time to reflect on who they want to name. <laughs> um, uh, which, which is, is a good way of avoiding an answer to the question. Uh, well, maybe I'm right learning some lessons <laughs> from professional politicians. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the, um, uh, the point that Tosil makes about needing to think about the cybersecurity side of all of this uh, is very important. Uh, the debate around disinformation and social media platforms is a fascinating debate that motivates a lot of comment. Um, we all have a view. Uh, but actually, quite a lot of the stuff that we have to protect is uh, cybersecurity. Uh, and it's relevant to elections. Obviously, it has a much wider relevance. Uh, but the work that we are doing there 
uh, at a European level and to support the work that's done in the individual member states is an important part of uh, mitigating risks around elections and our election security. So we are rolling out this uh, cybersecurity agency. We're rolling out, uh, which is there to coordinate efforts between member states and respond when there are big incidents. Uh, we're rolling out a process of using uh, standards and certification to raise cybersecurity, in particular in I Internet of Things devices. Uh, we are trying to organize better investment <coughs> in this area so that we are investing seriously and in an organized way in cybersecurity. We're looking at skills gaps and we're trying to raise skills levels because very often it's around people, uh, making sure the right people have the right skills to, to help with cybersecurity. All of that stuff is very important also to raising the security levels around uh, our elections. Yeah. I don't want to get into it, but I'll just mention briefly huh. that, that in, the, uh, in the United States, depending on who you listen to, either the Department of Homeland Defense that said 21 cases or the bizarrely named reality winner who was a NSA person who doxed uh, NSA material, 39 states had breaches of their voting lists. So this is getting fairly basic. I mean, breaches by either APT 28 or 29. So, I mean, if you get into the voter list and you change that, um, then you, I mean, you can really disrupt things. And this is this has nothing to do with social media, fake news, anything else. You just, you can engage in brilliant voter suppression if you want, if we do not guarantee the security of our voter registration list. I mean, that's fairly basic, but apparently, that has not been done in many places. Now, I don't know where that is in the European Union member states. I haven't found any material on this, frankly. I mean, that doesn't mean it's not a problem, but I have just not found it. Okay, great. And going back to this Cybersecurity Act, just very quickly, um, is this something that you envisage could be used um, to certify election software in the future? You were involved you in the I'm happy to answer that uh, right away, but uh, just one remark. I was really listening to the commissioner uh, and in, in a positive way. Uh, I need, if someone would say that there is very little progress, I need to say there is a lot of progress because when I joined the commission in 2004, I, w I was asking, you know, where is my safe? And the response was, what safe? I, and then the drivers, I said, were they screened? What, what do you mean by screen? I said, uh, what kind of, uh, I mean, uh, how the documentation is being treated. So, I mean, uh, that was really 2004 when uh, coming from uh, Czech government uh, to, uh, to the commissioner, the commissioner, I, I thought that this is, you know, like Wonderland. So, I mean, this is uh, incredible process. Now, to, to your question, and I was going to answer your question on, on, the, on the states uh, via rather the cyber security dimension than the fake news because, I mean, on the fake uh, news side, this is difficult to determine. You know, you can have one single case referendum, whatever, in a certain situation, and is it more vul vulnerable uh, or less? Uh, how, do you, how do you evaluate? But on cyber, I think we, c we can have uh, uh, a better answer. And my experience is, and I come, I'm Czech, so I would say that <coughs> while, let's say, the Czech relevant authority is not uh, necessarily the equivalent of the British, French, German, uh, which are really, I mean, uh, the, the top today, the fast, but it's somewhat below, uh, <coughs> but still much better than the majority of other similar entities. It's doing a very good, uh, good job. But at the same time, then you have the political representation, and unfortunately the president of the country, and I'm not turning political now, it's just a matter of fact, that will have a, a very unfortunate statement about the same institution. You know, then how do you evaluate? Are you more or less vulnerable? So in, in resilience, you've got a quite a solid environment, uh, uh, good work. I mean, even the Czech uh, relevant uh, services, uh, top, especially towards the east. But then you have a politician which doesn't have uh, uh, the basic, let's say, ability of responsibility. And, you know, what, what better can you expect in Kremlin than the president of a member state saying, you know, that these guys, they should move, whether it was on Huawei, other issues. But on cyber as such, yes, it is a progress, but this is what I meant at the very beginning. We could have gone further if we would have been ready, if, uh, and, and we have not been ready. I mean, a number of the member states, uh, uh, a number of MEPs and so on would be looking for issues where they felt that uh, 
from a competence point of view, is going by f too far. But I think that we do have, at least today, a better, uh, more efficient uh, uh, certification schemes. And of course, if you ask me about elections, the technology is... Uh, the Ilves has uh, said basically the only pa paperwork is the one that you, you throw it in the, in the ballot. Yes, but that uh, will be considered as a strategic infrastructure, which is today in the hands of the member states. And I think that this is what we have to look at, because I don't see the difference. Of course, there is a difference between the strategic infrastructure and then uh, something that is below. But I see the, the differences much more narrow. They are much more closer, because as I quite often say, I can hack something that is really of not necessarily strategic uh, infrastructure importance, but highly important via fridge. I don't even need a uh, cell phone. Yeah, this is the era, I mean, uh, uh, I'm not a, uh, a high-tech person, I don't have the brain for it, but I do understand that today in the system I can just uh, use uh, a fridge and I, hang, I can hack something which is uh, much, much broader, uh, much more sophisticated uh, and absolutely key. So yes, we have made a progress, and I think that we will make a progress in the future, but we manage the, the maximum uh, for which we had at a certain point political will. So it is going to be a gradual process, but we need to be there to be able to review the progress. We need to be able to react very quickly. That's why we wanted to have a business, let's say, in one of the bodies that is working with ANISA, because who else than the business should uh, be one step ahead of us? Who else than the business should say, we've got a problem with you know, that device which we thought as certified as it is, uh, two years ago is perfect, but it's not. And we've got an idea. So we really need a solid interaction of all the layers. And there we see that someone still doesn't get it. And that's why I spoke with the mindset. So yes, it is a progress uh, and sizable, but I think that uh, there is still a long way to go. And, uh, and I think that it's going to be sometimes two step, uh, steps forward and one step backwards. Fascinating. Mr. Ilves, yet very quickly, and then we're going to turn to the audience uh, for some I questions. I think there's one more issue that we have, which is so as basic as you can get, which lies behind much of this. And that is actually the understanding of digital issues on the part of policymakers and politicians. Um, and social media, I think, is such a big topic also because it's something you can have an opinion on. Yeah. But um, where in, in 2014, uh, I was in office, I visited the European Parliament and gave a lecture on uh, the digital era. And uh, there were about 40 MEPs there. And I pulled out my phone and I said, you all have one of these. I said, your next election is in four and a half years. That is three iterations of Moore's law, which is that the power of a chip doubles every year and a half. So, and I said, so you, this same thing that you hold in your hand, in, in, when you're running again, will be two to the third times more powerful. And someone in the audience said, what is two to the third? Um, now, this is, this is already a self-selected group of people interested in digital things, and they do not know what two to the third power is which is eight if you don't know and you don't want to say anything, right? Uh, this is, uh, I mean, this is a, such a fundamental problem. I mean, we saw it with the Zuckerberg hearings also in the United States. How do you make your money? I mean, you know, if you, if you, I mean, you, I mean, I don't even know what to say to that when the people who are making the political decisions who are the political leaders have such a bare minimal understanding of math, science, technology, that it's, it's difficult to see that you'd get policies out of this. And so I think, I mean, this goes back to, I mean, you need ultimately to create, I mean, to do education for these people. Yeah. Digital literacy for politicians. Um, uh, yeah, if you'd like to come back very, very quickly, and then we're going to turn to the One comment audience, I yeah. wanted to address is that looking for the weakest link among the member states is a mistake, because we have to address problems that are present in all member states. It's not just an issue of one cert being weaker than the other, and the NIS directive requires us also to have certs, so that's one issue that's being taken care of to get baseline measures. But we see that attacks uh, regarding election security are in big member states that are the most prepared in Europe, but they still are attacked, and they still have effects on their election security. So we have to find solutions that do not look for simply increasing technical uh, capabilities, but are more universal. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I've just been told, unfortunately, that we've completely run out of time, I'm afraid. So <laughs> I see no the figure of three minutes. Three <laughs> yeah. I'm getting uh, you, indications that it's over. Fake fake news. News. There you go. Well, minutes, maybe we've yeah. got a time for maybe two questions before we yeah. finish them. We've got two or three <coughs> minutes. One question. <laughs> One question. 
Maybe one or two. Um, if you'd like to raise your hands. My good, there goes this. Is, my this soft is version of democracy. This yeah? is, uh, no questions. In our own negotiations at the moment. Um, raise your hand. Let us know where you're from. And please let us know who your question is directed towards. We've got one lady over here. If we could get her a microphone, please. I'm from Brazil. Thank you. Uh, my name is Christina Frutos. I come from the private sector, my company Indra. We've been doing election systems all over the world for 30 years so far. So first thing I, w I would like to say is that I really praise the efforts of the um, European Commission. What do you are doing on the, you know, trying to raise awareness on the security, big security issues that all the election systems across Euros, Europe have? and build the networks, communicate, and all that is amazing. And really, um, it should have been earlier, that's for tr but it's very much welcome. Now, one question for you, Commissioner King, um, and it's related to the Cyber Act and the applicability to election systems. From a technical point, uh, I'm not uh, talking about the political side of it. I'm just talking about the technical part of it. Really, the industry is looking for a framework to work equally across all member states on elections systems. So do you envisage that the Cyber Act will be further developed into a framework for election systems to work, for, for secure elections in the future? Thank you. By the way, praising just the commission, the lady lost all the sympathies of the European Parliament. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I can speed things up because I think the next people on include um, uh, Anders Ansip, uh, who will be able to continue replying to questions uh, on behalf of the Commission. As far as I'm concerned, uh, we're, still, we're still rolling out exactly how the uh, standards and certification process is going to work in different areas. But as far as I'm concerned, I can't see any reason why that standard and certifications process shouldn't go into issues connected with uh, hardware uh, that is involved in election. That is an obvious area where people would be looking to try and uh, agree some, uh, some standards. So uh, we, we, need to, we need to see how this rolls out. We've been given some steers, including by the European Parliament as we were negotiating this. Uh, there are different categories of strategic infrastructure, uh, less strategic important infrastructure and Internet of Things devices. Uh, but as I, I can't see any reason why we shouldn't be exploring, uh, in light of experience, how you would use standards and certifications to drive up cybersecurity around electoral processes. Yeah, just one sentence, just to add up to it, because uh, we ran out of time, and I, I think as referred to Anders Ansip, he will able to elaborate in greater detail. But basically, if you look in, into the Cybersecurity Act, you will see the procedures, you will see also the division of, of labor. So I agree with the Commissioner, yes, but there are a few buts, but I think that uh, with some technology and the moment it is identified as, uh, as such where we need, uh, let's say, European certification schemes, then it may cover it. But uh, some will fall out of it. But as I say, we run out of time. Otherwise, we'd be happy to go in, into greater detail. Wonderful. Now, the Vice President has been waiting very, very patiently in, in his seat. And I know uh, everyone's also looking forward to hearing what he's got to say. So thank you very, very much for coming along and taking part. And thanks very much to our panel and CyberSec.